This is the Build Wealth Canada podcast, episode number 88. Welcome to the Build Wealth Canada podcast, where it's all about becoming debt-free, accelerating your wealth, and taking control of your money. Now, here's your host, Cornell Schreiber. Hey, it's Cornell, and welcome to the Build Wealth Canada show. Today, I'm extremely excited to have Canadian best-selling author Andrew Hallam back on the show. His first book, Millionaire Teacher, continues to be the number one bestseller in the investment and portfolio management category on Amazon. He is one of the world's most prolific financial wellness speakers, and over the past 16 years, he has given hundreds of talks in over 30 different countries, espousing research on financial wellness, sound investing, and life satisfaction. Faction. He's been investing in the stock market for 32 years, having built a million dollar portfolio on a school teacher's salary when he was in his late 30s. I had Andrew on the show earlier this year to talk about his latest book, which is called Balance How to Invest and Spend for Happiness, Health, and Wealth. And since then, the book has now also been released in audiobook format. So you can get it in that format if you'd like from your favorite audiobook provider. I definitely enjoyed the book and I picked up some really good best practices from it. And I think you'll like it as well. Now, in today's interview with Andrew, we cover the subject of work after having hit your financial independence number. Lots of early retirees in the FIRE movement and traditional retirees as well continue to do some sort of productive work. Now, why is that? And is it realistic to never work again after you retire? As you can imagine, generating some minor income after retirement, doing something you actually love, can drastically decrease how much money you actually need to retire from your day job, potentially letting you leave the job you may dislike or be bored of many, many years earlier. So since Andrew is already financially independent, we dissect how Andrew has found that balance in his life between taking on meaningful and fulfilling work and balancing that with leisure, health, and just happiness in general. Now, before we start the interview, I have a big announcement to make, and that is that I am now an instructor over at the Investing Academy. So as you may already know, I have a how to invest course specifically for Canadians that's actually already been taken by close to 1000 students here in Canada. But what I thought would be more valuable to you is if instead of just offering the one course on investing, if I join a group of Canadian instructors, each with different specialties that cover other areas of personal finance, such as retirement, financial planning, advanced investing strategies, real estate investing, and a lot more. That way, I figure you have access to more instructors than just me. You can get your questions answered by us, each with our own specialty, and you're getting a more holistic education on the personal finance topics that are most relevant to you at this particular point in your life, no matter where you are on your financial independence journey. So I hope you check it out. And to make it not risky for you at all, I created a special link where you can access all the courses, not just mine, but all of them, plus ask the instructors your questions for free for 14 days. It's essentially a free 14-day trial that's only available to Build Wealth Canada listeners. Everyone else has to pay right away in order to get access. And in the free trial, you'll get access to all the content and all the instructors so that you can learn a ton and see if it's right for you. So to get access to everything for free for the 14 days, all you have to do is go to buildwealthcanada.ca slash training. That's buildwealthcanada.ca slash training. All right. So I hope you see you there. And now let's get into the interview. All right, Andrew, welcome back. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. It's great to be back. Really nice to have you back. And when we spoke before the interview, you mentioned that sometimes when pursuing money and financial independence, we can actually fall into a trap and miss the point of why we pursue it in the first place. And in relation to that, in your book, you talk about how we need to be careful about how we define success and how we need to strive for the goal of life satisfaction as opposed to just high monetary figure within our portfolio. Can you speak to that a bit? Yeah, I think, you know, when we ask the question, why? Why do we do anything? Anything. Like, why do you go to the bathroom? Why did you choose to run that 10K? Why did you choose to, are you choosing to raise your children a certain way? Why are you choosing to invest for your future or go for that particular job? When we ask that question, why, the answers will vary at first. But then when we continue to dig with why, eventually 
people will say, well, it makes me feel good or happy or safe or secure. Eventually, that's what it's all about. It's what we we strive for. And these are all essences of life satisfaction. Well, that's why we do what we do. So everything from going to the bathroom to saving money for your retirement, bottom line is like, yeah, there's an element of life satisfaction associated with that. But when I wrote the book Balance, what I wanted to look at was what are the elements that contribute to life satisfaction? So if life satisfaction is the goal, then life satisfaction equals success. But conventionally, you know, we have this definition of success being somebody who has maybe millions of dollars and or has a big house and or a really prestigious career and and drives a Maserati. But what happens, I think, in the pursuit of that is we often end up dropping other balls. And so for me, it was, I think, doing a lot of traveling and speaking at major corporations And rubbing shoulders with plenty of people who, from a conventional standpoint, were very successful. So they were CEOs of corporations, for example. And and our lifestyle was kind of unique or has been unique over the past eight years because we've spent time, I've spent time speaking at banks and international schools and insurance companies and investment firms, being invited by these CEOs, typically later to socialize and spend time with them. And then what we'll do is, you know, we'll fly, let's say, back to Guatemala, where my wife and I might have our camper van in storage. And then we'll drive around Guatemala and we'll hang out with people who are, you know, almost bohemian by nature, raising their kids in an RV, playing music as they go. And it it made me really reassess what it means to be successful, the identity or the the definition of it and see it as really quite skewed because many of the people who I would see living this fairly alternative lifestyle had a twinkle in their eye that many of the others didn't. They laughed more readily than many of the others who were conventionally successful. And I'm not meaning to say that if you're the CEO of a company, you're not going to have this balance. But the balance is essential. So the balance for success identified four quadrants. So one was having enough money. Like if you're a bohemian family and you're just living month to month, there's a level of stress associated with that. The families that I saw as successful were sure they were playing music as they went and maybe they were homeschooling their kids, seemed like they were having a great time, but they also saved money. So they were less stressed in that capacity. So they were living on less than they earned and they saved for the future. So we do all need enough money. Like we need enough money for a good shelter, for food, for healthcare, money for experiences that we can spend on experiences, uh, money to put away for our future and money to give. So we all need an element of money. So I have these four quadrants. That was one of them. Another is relationships. So when you look at the Harvard study of adult development, it's this eight decade long study. And essentially it's trying to identify like, what is it that leads to a happy, content filled life? And what they found is more than even genetics, more than money, it's relationships. So relationships are another part of that quadrant. So if you're a CEO of a company or you have millions of dollars and a very a huge investment portfolio, but your relationships are a train wreck. If our end goal is life satisfaction, then I would argue that that person is not a success. So the third quadrant is health. So we all have one vessel and we have to look after it. And none of us can control what genetics we've inherited. None of us can control how long we're going to live but we can stack the odds in our favor. We can do what we can to try to eat well, try to sleep well, and try to exercise well. Because like I say, we have one vessel. And you you and I both know people who financially have put a lot of effort into building wealth while letting their bodies break down or go to pot. But we have that one, that one vessel. And when it comes to life satisfaction too, we know that the 
the energy that we get from being active ends up boosting life satisfaction tremendously. The fourth quadrant was a, what was what I called purpose or what the Japanese call ikigai. So we need a sense of purpose. And this is one of the reasons why I mean, we truly need it. Like we need it on a cellular level. So the idea that we should strive, and, and it's one of the things we often do is we strive to retire. Like we strive to retire early. But what the, re- and the research is compelling on this, research suggests that on aggregate, when we retire earlier, we die earlier. And, and that's not to say that someone you know, can't retire at 30 and live until they're 120. That absolutely can happen. But generally speaking, when we look at the research, and the research is really robust on this, um, that was a study published in the Journal of Epidemiology and Community Health. There's, there are several Harvard health studies done on the fact that if we you know, live a, work a little bit past retirement age, we actually end up living longer because we have that sense of purpose. We have a connection with people. And when I say working, I'm not saying that you have to work full time. That's something you hate, but that's the worst thing. You know, so if you get close to your financial independence number, whatever that is for you, the idea that you dial back, take some work that's part-time that you're passionate about, that you enjoy, you'll end up being engaged with people of different, uh, different age groups. You'll be com- continually learning uh, and it's social. So just that process itself allows you to boost life satisfaction plus, uh, plus longevity. So research suggests that people that do retire earlier that truly just you know, play golf and hang out with friends and what have you, their odds of getting dementia and Alzheimer's are significantly higher because the brain is like a muscle. Like you have to use it or you lose it. So you end up getting a lot of cobwebs essentially forming in the brain if you're not actually exercising it. So yeah, those are my uh, four quadrants of success, having enough money, having solid relationships, having health, and having a sense of purpose. I love that. When I read that in your book, I remember highlighting it and, and actually copy and pasting it somewhere so I can review it periodically because I think it's so easy to get distracted by some of them and, and sort of take these extremes on one of them, especially the career one I find, right? For the type A personalities like myself out there, it's so easy to just kind of focus on that. And then all of a sudden, you know, your health starts slipping and your relationships start slipping because you've got these ambitions because of the way you're wired and such. So, yeah, so I actually have those pillars written out and I've, I'm making an effort to actually review them periodically after reading your book, just to sort of get that reminder, like, hey, make sure that you're covering all these bases. Don't just cover one base really well because you actually need all of them to actually be satisfied and happy to live longer and all of that. So yeah, so I, I love that part of your book. That was for sure my favorite. No, oh, thank you. Awesome. And now a quick message from one of our sponsors. Hey everyone, just want to give a big thanks to Shopify for sponsoring this episode. It's always nice to see a Canadian company become so popular worldwide and do so well. And one of the reasons that I really like them is that they make it really easy for entrepreneurs and those that want to have a side hustle to get started and run their businesses. Now, when I first started the podcast, there were at least a dozen tools and services that I had to set up and integrate just to have a site. And things get even more complicated when I actually wanted to sell something as now you're dealing with e-commerce, security, privacy, and a lot more. So the reason that I'm a big fan of Shopify is that they are essentially an all-in-one solution for small business owners. You can set up your site using their tools and they'll take care of these technical details for you. Essentially, you don't have to go through the tedious process that I had to go through when getting your business off the ground. So I'm definitely a big fan of Shopify as they help make it easier than ever to start, run, and grow your own business. They are already powering many of Canada's favorite businesses and allow Canadians to sell the products worldwide. You can go to shopify.ca slash BWC, all lowercase, for a free 14-day trial. There, you can create your store with the look you want, and there's no need for you to know how to design or code. So I really love how Shopify makes starting your own business possible for anyone. So you can start selling on Shopify today by going to shopify.ca slash BWC right now. That's shopify.ca slash BWC, all lowercase. 
So when a lot of people, you know, myself included, start their financial dependence journey, the goal is to never work again. And that becomes a major motivator to accumulate all those savings to be able to retire. And then yet from my own experience and after interviewing many other early retirees, I've noticed a pattern where most, if not all, still end up doing some sort of productive work or something that could be classified as work, even though they don't have to since they've already reached their financial independence number. And kind of in relation to what you just said in your previous answer, I guess it's because they kind of they need that sort of fulfillment piece and that's not being filled by this life of just pure leisure. So did you have the same experience as you moved from the accumulation stage to the financial independence and retirement stage. And from your experience, what have you found to be a good balance in your own life? Obviously following those pillars, but maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah, for me, it was something where, you know, what my wife and I did, she wanted a year off and we were, were both working as teachers. She was teaching Spanish, high school Spanish. I was teaching high school personal finance and high school English. And we just thought we would take a year off to travel. And then one year led to two, which led to three. And as you know, it led to like seven or eight now ongoing. And I have continued to do work. I mean, I really enjoy writing. So I have regular column with Asset Builder. I write a monthly column for the Globe and Mail. And during that time, I ended up writing a couple of books as well. So I did a second edition of Millionaire Teacher and then an edition of Balance. I need to continue to do things it fills me with a sense of purpose and I enjoy it. And I think that's the cool part is that, you know, when you have your finances in order, and when I say your finances in order, I'm not necessarily saying, you know, you've got that number at which you don't have to work again. I mean, you could even be relatively close to F5, not there fully and choose then to dial back and do something you love. I was really lucky because as a school teacher, I loved what I did. And so it was my wife who said, let's take this year off. She wanted a break. It, it was always just fun for me. Like, it was like, wow, I can't believe they pay me for this. Mm-hmm. And, you know, some teachers listening to this are going to be nodding their heads. They're going to be in that camp as well. And others will probably think, be thinking, oh, Helen's completely crazy. It's such a hard job. I loved it. And I found, though, that I need to continue doing things. And I think, you know, the research is so robust on this. Plus, when you have people who are, who are driven. Like I would say a lot of the people in the fire community are they're goal oriented people to begin with (laughs) Mm -hmm. the fact that they're goal oriented people and they're not people that are going to be satisfied sitting around on something like welfare, for example, there's a different type of person here. They're drivers. They set goals. They want to achieve them. They'll continue to want to achieve them. And so the idea that they'll be happy with absolutely doing nothing is, is quite flawed. In that, you know, when you look at what Daniel Kahneman said, he's an economist, uh, behavioral economist who won a Nobel Prize. Uh, He said that we don't know what will make us happy. We're actually really bad at projecting what's going to give us satisfaction. So a lot of young people are going to be saying, well, I want to strive for financial independence so I don't have to work anymore. We think that will make us happy, but it generally doesn't. We do need that sense of purpose, but it's on our own terms. And that I think is what's really cool about it. You know, when we talk about longevity and and I love looking at longevity studies, we look at areas of the world where Dan Bootner calls them blue zones. And what he finds is these are little areas in the world where people live the longest. And they tend to be regions where people continue to work. They keep moving. They are incredibly social. And so because they're moving, they're healthy because they continue to work in some capacity. Like I'm not saying they work full time at a grind until they're 70, 80, 90 years old. They work at part-time jobs. They help out with the community. So I I fall back to those four pillars of success that I look at. And it covers all of those. You know, the blue zone areas where people live the longest tend to be those zones where relationships are good. they They have money. They have a sense of purpose because they continue to work. And of course, because they're moving around, because they're active, they they tend to have higher levels of health. I love your tip about someone that maybe is getting close to FI and how instead of just grinding it out and just trying to hit that number so they can fully retire and live a permanent life of leisure, how instead to consider for those people to consider just take a step back and 
because maybe they don't, you don't have to grind it out anymore. Maybe you have been grinding it out because you will graduate university or college. You're trying to get your career. You're trying to make you know the money so you can actually hit that fine number. You're working really hard, but maybe you can actually stop grinding it out and do something that you really enjoy if you just accept the fact that you're, you should actually still continue to do some sort of productive work. Just do it on your own terms and something you like, as opposed to just doing something because it tends to pay well because of the paycheck. I think that ice from you alone could save someone years of their life. And it could be really tough years, right? Where like you're like, I'm thinking, you know, like I went to school with a lot of people who are now like investment bankers, right? And they're working these, these crazy hours, right? But they're getting paid a lot of money. And it's like, well, what if you could stop that? And now actually, you know, and instead of having to do that for a few more years, because it's hard to sustain that, right? When you're working crazy hours, how your health can easily start to slip family can easily start to slip, right? Because of all the the demands of the job. So that was gold, what you just said there. I think that could literally save people years of potentially an unhappy life because you can actually just change the terms of how you work, right? Yeah. I think Cornell, you you really nailed it when you're looking at often people who have high stress jobs that they're not enjoying that happen to pay a lot of money. When Richard Easterland did studies on happiness, life satisfaction, as it related to income, he found that life satisfaction increased with income up to a certain point. And then there was a flat line. But a Purdue-based university recently did a study where they looked at dozens of different countries on different continents. So in Europe, Central America, South America, Middle East, North America. And what they found was there's actually a downward slope beyond a certain income point. And in North America, that happened to be about 160,000 US dollars. So again, you know, somebody could be earning three hundred or five hundred thousand dollars a year, and I'm not saying that they're not living a life of absolute harmony and balance. But on aggregate, what ends up happening is generally this is what the research points to, and it's really robust. It's that there's a typically a downward slope after about one hundred and sixty thousand U.S. dollars, and the theories behind that there are a couple of them. One is that such people have more money, so they spend more money thinking that by spending money on stuff, it will enhance their life satisfaction. But that's just like just eating sugars all the time. And we talked about that before based on hedonic adaptability. You just get used to what you buy. So it never doesn't really enhance your life. Number two is that such jobs tend to have high responsibility associated with them and high time commitments associated with them. And so when you have a job like that, you potentially are not sleeping as long or as well. You're not looking after your health to the same degree, and you're not investing as much time in your relationships. If you're working really long, hard hours, you're spending less time with your kids. I mean, that's just the bottom line. It's just, there are just these, and your, your spouse and your friends, these are the balls that we drop. So it is really interesting when you say, you know, Cornell, like, those that will be grinding it out. In the book Balance, I say that life is like a a dark hourglass and everybody has one. And at birth, it gets tipped, but you cannot see how much sand you have left. And so if you're grinding it out at a job that you don't really enjoy with the hopes that at some point in time, you're going to have the money, the freedom to allow you to enjoy life, I see that as quite wrong headed because that person could die next week. Our longevity isn't guaranteed for any of us. And people who are listening to this, you all know somebody who just kicked the bucket completely unexpectedly at a relatively young age. Like there are no guarantees in life. So when we're working, especially when we're working at a job we don't like, we are prostituting our lives. Our employers are paying for pieces of our lives. So my recommendation is to try your very best not to end up ever doing, if you have a choice, if you have a choice not to ever end up doing a job that you don't enjoy just for the paycheck. Yeah, that's great advice. I remember I had an experience like that and it was just, it's not sustainable. The, The money thing is fun initially because it's like, I guess, a nice ego boost and that whole thing. At least that was the case for me. But then eventually the lack of fulfillment just gets to you and the grind gets to you and not enjoying it gets to you. And you just, at least myself, I couldn't keep it up anymore. Like at one point 
the money was so great, but then at one point you kind of like, I don't care about the money anymore. And it's such an interesting contrast where one mm. year you're, you know, when you just got the job, you're, you're ecstatic because you're making, you know, it's again, it's like an ego thing, I guess, right? Like at least you're making so much. And then it's interesting how that can completely 180 where all of a sudden you're like, I don't care anymore <laughs> because you're miserable. Right. So yeah, I think that's yeah. fantastic advice. Yeah, we need to step back and ask ourselves why we're doing this. Well, I'm doing it for the money. I'm going to suck it up for the money. Okay, so why do you want money? You know, it's really great to ask that question. It may seem like an obvious question. I want money so that eventually people will say, I want money so I can be happy. They won't say that at first, but if you keep digging, why do you want that money? So I can be happy. Okay, so money equals happiness. So define this for me, like, and, and you can put people in some really awkward spots, but it's a soul searching spot that every person actually needs to put themselves into. So I'm not saying that the pursuit of financial independence is wrong. Absolutely not. You know, I'm like, in a sense, I'm a pioneer of that. I mean, I loved just doing what I enjoyed and becoming financially free. And then knowing that I had the choice to work on my terms and enjoy what I wanted to do. So I've been really, really fortunate. And I know that, like, I know I've been fortunate to be in that position where there was no grinding it out for me. So I chose a passionate, I chose a job. This was something that a, a mechanic spoke to me about when I was 19 and I started investing. He said, Andrew, you know, if you learn to be financially literate, you can do a job you enjoy that may not necessarily pay a massive amount of money, but if you're smart with your money, you can gain relatively early financial independence. And so that's what I ended up doing. So I'm glad that at no point, you know, I ended up doing a job that I hated. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember you mentioned that story before. I think it was it's the mechanic that was actually like a millionaire or multimillionaire, right? Uh, but he just yeah, did yeah. it because he actually enjoyed that work. And so it wasn't for the, about the money anymore. It was, I guess, the problem solving of being a mechanic and that kind of thing. So, yeah. yeah. And yeah. he still yeah. works in some capacity too, which is really interesting. So that guy, he's in his mid seventies and he just loves, like when you say problem solving, yep. that's exactly yep. it for him. To him, you know, when someone brings in a vehicle, it's like, huh, okay. So when, you know, they'll basically they'll, he's retired from his job at BC Transit, but he's got a garage in his house. And he works on people's cars, mm-hmm. not like full time, not all the time, but it, for him, it gives him a, a real sense of achievement, accomplishment, purpose, and he likes the problem solving aspect of it. So he's always using his brain. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. So you've spoken with many other early retirees who I assume had a similar experience in terms of that progression from initially never wanting to work again and live a life of leisure permanently versus eventually realizing that there needs to be a balance to achieve sustainable happiness. Have you noticed any patterns from those you've talked to in terms of how they were able to find sustainable happiness and what that balance was for them in order to achieve it? You mentioned about the the pillars before, but is there anything kind of else that you wanted to add to that? I think most of those that have been successful with early retirement had established early on a level of experimentation with different things. And so we take you, for example, you're experimenting with, and you started experimenting, obviously, with podcast and different things. You know, Canadian Financial Summit, for example, like these were all experiments. These were all things that you were doing. And so you, know, you initially had your day job, and then here are these experiments. And if these experiments weren't fun for you, you would have stopped. All right. But you actually get a lot of pleasure out of them and you enjoy them. And so you're at this point where, you don't necessarily need your day job, I'm assuming. Yep. And so that's what's really cool is because you experimented with different passions, you were able then just to seamlessly continue whatever it was that you were doing before on the side just for kicks. There are some people who decide that you know they really it doesn't really matter about what the research says. They'll they'll still believe that doing nothing is going to give them the greatest amount of life satisfaction. And it's so interesting reading occasionally, you know, like a story in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal about someone who did that, decided that they were going to do nothing forever and how it ended up dragging them down and causing misery. And so you'll read a lot of stories about that. And it's almost like an anti-fire story, you know, an anti-financial dependence story. But I think what you have there is just a case of imbalance where the person isn't realizing that 
they need to do things and to set goals and to explore passions and enjoy. And because they have financial independence, those things that they're doing don't necessarily even have to be for a paycheck. You know, they can just be volunteer work, helping other people, or just, you know, earning a small amount of money working part-time at something that they enjoy. Did you find that with some people, this is an observation that I had, I'm curious to hear your your point of view on it, that there are some people that it seems like they are lucky in the sense that really early on in their life, they discover what they love, what their passion is, and they just go full throttle towards that passion, right? Like someone just, I don't know, loves music and they, you know, they pick up a guitar when they're four <laughs> or what, I'm just making this up and they just, it just, something just clicks and they're like, this is what I want to do, you know, for the rest of my life. And some people maybe have that with programming or, you know, other areas. Right. And then I think that, I think that's great. I never had that personally. And so I think for the rest of us, I think what you said about the experimentation to view things as experiments instead, where it's like, I don't know what I want to do for the rest of my life or what my like sort of passion is. So instead, instead of putting this pressure on yourself to find that one true thing, to instead experiment with different things that you hypothesize might actually bring you joy and happiness and fulfillment, and then just see how that goes. And if it doesn't go well, if it doesn't bring you what you thought it would in terms of fulfillment, you just stop doing it. And if it does, then you keep doing it. What do you think of that approach and viewing it that way? Oh, I love that. And there's another, there's another element here too. In the last chapter of the book, Balance, I touch on probably one of my favorite subjects, which is the perception of time. And so we all have, you know, a certain amount of time that we're on this earth. And to an extent, we can control that to an extent, but there's a lot that's out of our control. But what we can control, what's really exciting is we can control our perception of time. So we can actually live longer without chronologically living longer. And doing what you're talking about there, Cornell, where you experiment with different passions actually extends your perception. So I'm going to give you an example here. If listeners, you're listening to me right now and you've gone on a trip somewhere, let's say, so you've flown someplace and it's got to be someplace that you've never been before and it might be a foreign country, might not be, but you're not just, you know, sitting on a beach drinking margaritas. Like you're actually doing something different where you're, you're immersing yourself in maybe different geography or different cultures, different people. And when you, let's say you've been there for a week. And when you think back to when you landed at that place, let's say you flew there, you'll find yourself just reflecting and going, wow, was that just like seven days ago that I arrived? Because it seems like we've done so much. We measure time based on alternative stimuli. It's one of the reasons why, you know, when you're in the eighth grade, that year seems to last so long. I mean, of course, one year for a 13-year-old kid is a, is a higher percentage of their actual existence than it is for a 40-year-old. But there's something to the effect that as an eighth grader, everything is changing. They are changing. Their friends are changing. Their mentality is changing. Their bodies are changing. They have a friend and they have a fight with that friend. And there's a new kid and they get along with the new kid. Now they're not. And then there's a girlfriend or there's a boyfriend. And it's just, we measure time based on alternative stimuli. And if we push alternative stimuli into our lives, it stretches our perception of time. So now back to your concept of experimenting with different things, like, Hey, let's experiment with this. Let's take up guitar. Let's learn guitar. You know, not necessarily wait until you're retired or financially independent to do that, but let's just try that. Let's try and learn another language. Let's try to become a yoga instructor or a a personal fitness trainer. Through that process of learning, we slow down our perception of time and we build in all of these alternative stimuli. So that for me is one of the the most exciting concepts because Cornell, I don't know how long I'm going to live. No one does but I want to be able to squeeze out as much life as I can from the time I have. Because then you get into topics like routines, for example, right? But I guess, I suppose, even if you like to keep a certain routine because it works really well for you, it makes you productive, that kind of a thing. I guess with the routine, it can still be that you're you're doing those different experiments within your routine, I suppose, right? So it's not like 
you have to be all just go with the flow, free flowing, always new things, new things, new things. There can be, I guess, some structure, I would think, by just focusing on sort of that, that novelty and the new stimuli. I think there's ways to combine them. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, when we talk about routine, one of the things that that I do is I set a goal at the beginning of each day and I write down what it is I'm going to do at different points in time. And it sounds like I might be super structured or a workaholic, but I'm not because I, I structure in leisure time, nap time, sometimes meditation time. I'm actually kind of lazy in that respect, but I'll structure in work time and different things that I may not ordinarily be doing. Mm-hmm. but I'll put but I'll put them in and schedule it. So I'm experimenting, but I'm doing it in a goal-oriented way and I don't do it all the time, but most of the time I do sort of plan out my day like that so that I'm purposeful about what it is that I want to be doing. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting because yeah, I found I've been experimenting with that as well, the kind of the whole structured life versus unstructured and different there's different degrees to that obviously as well. And so yeah, like yourself, I also found that that works quite well, where you do want some sort of structure, you still want some sort of goals. Because if you just say, oh, well, just go with the flow, then you could just end up watching TV for half the day. And then you actually finish that session and you don't feel good at all. (laughs) You feel like you've kind of wasted a lot of time, right? So I think there is that sort of balance of, again, coming back to your book, that balance of, okay, some structure and planning and goals can actually be really good for you. And you can still sort of, they don't have to be boring because you could always be experimenting with new things. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So after reading your book as well, it becomes really clear that health and longevity is something that is a high priority for you and should be for all of us since what's the point of accumulating all this wealth and retiring if you don't live long enough to actually enjoy it. So (laughs) from the research that you've done, what have you found to be the best practices to maximize our health and longevity? You seem from everything I've heard. And then you look great. You look great. Like you are in very good shape. And I know you've had like a run in with cancer as well in the past uh, from one of the other interviews I've seen with you. So, I mean, I know for sure this is something that's been on your radar and something that I'm under the impression that you've researched quite a bit. So can you share with us, you know, how you stay healthy, how you practice you know, to try to maximize longevity? Well, one of the things that I find, you know, pretty interesting is You could look at research on like, what's the best physical activity to do? And there will be people who try to answer that question. And they might say, well, it's cross-country skiing, you know, cardiovascular, you use all different muscles. Others might say it's swimming. But the best activity for you is the activity that you will keep doing for as long as possible because you enjoy it. So if it's tennis and you love tennis, that's the best activity for you. If you hate the gym, but you love tennis, then play tennis for as long as you can, because you're going to be, you're going to be able to, you're not going to stop. You're not going to quit. You're going to be, you're going to be able to keep moving. And that's the key. It's that we keep moving. So I'm not suggesting that we should all be Olympic level, or we should all be able to run a marathon, but the idea that we have some kind of physical activity, at least three to four days a week, is really essential, especially when we're able to bring in elements of flexibility into that. So, you know, the odd yoga class, the odd Pilates class, or the odd Pilates session or yoga session, or just a stretch session. So one of the things I do is I, I do stretch on a daily basis, just stretching my body. And when you get, you know, when you look at old people, even when you look at old marathoners and they're walking around, they still look like old guys. But when you're looking at an old Tai Chi master or a yogi, somebody who's you know into yoga, yoga or Pilates, and you watch an 80-year-old walk, they have great posture, they have great flexibility. It's flexibility that ends up getting us. So that's the one thing that even if it's not fun, that's the one thing that I recommend people do is to just, you know, at least four days a week. I try to do it every single day, is work on your actual physical flexibility. That's really important. How long would you recommend you do it for? Like in terms of, you know, an hour, half an hour? You know, I I would suggest putting on your favorite podcast and just stretching for 20 minutes Mm -hmm. and sometimes just working it into your day as well. So what I'll do, and my wife laughs at me, but, you know, I'll do a little bit of stretching when when I'm on the go. Like if I'm waiting at a bus stop or whatever, I'll just hang my calves off, perhaps off a curb, 
and just to get a natural stretch of my calves. And so just these little things that I try to do throughout the day, just to maintain that level of of flexibility. But again, the most important thing is do the activity you like to do, because that's the activity that you'll continue to do. That's a great tip. And what about the whole nutrition piece? And I guess we can kind of merge that with the whole cancer prevention, which is, I think, another thing that we obviously all want to try to prevent as well. Can you speak to that a little bit? Because I imagine you've researched that quite a bit when you had that run-in with cancer. What do you recommend when it comes to that? Well, the key here is to, and again, you could have the best diet in the world and still get cancer. You could be a stress-free person who meditates on a daily basis and still get cancer. But the likelihood of you getting it earlier is higher if you're not eating well, sleeping well. So for example, a 30 year old may have ended up getting cancer and dying at 20, you know, if they didn't follow a healthy lifestyle. So if they die at 30, if they hadn't followed a healthy lifestyle, it might've happened earlier, but this just, there's so much that's, you know, unfortunate luck that goes into play here. I think it's good to just try to stack the deck in your favor. So one of those things is sugars, eliminate sugars to the best of your ability, eliminate them. Cancer loves sugar. Sugar is a cause of all kinds of issues. And so it's sugars and then foods that convert to sugars. So cancer loves them. It's just like, you know, if you have some cancer cells, everybody has cancer cells, everybody, I have them in my body. You have them in your body. Every listener listening to this has cancer cells in their body. Now, whether they get cancer or not is a different thing. And so what we want to try and do is not encourage growth. So not encourage a cluster of those cancer cells to basically get to bet, to get together and grow. And so one of the ways we can discourage them is to eliminate you know, things like for me, for example, I, you know, this might sound really extreme, but you know, if you said to me, Andrew, yeah, this is definitely going to be sound really extreme, but I'll be really honest here. I'll just say it. Your listeners are going to think I'm nuts. But if you said, Andrew, I'm going to give you $10,000 to drink this can of Coca-Cola, I won't do it. So, you know, it's just, it's so high in sugar. And if that can is the tipping point and we're talking about my life and I'm laying at some point, I get cancer in a couple of years and I'm laying in a hospital bed. I'd always wonder, I might always wonder, you know, was that can of Coke a tipping point? So I want to do what I can do not to get totally stressed out about it, but do what I can do to try not to, to bring, you know, unnecessary sugars into my body. Food has enough sugars in it as it is. You know, you've got natural sugars in fruit. You've got things like pastas and rices that convert to sugar. So we already ingest enough sugar. I think we should try our best not to ingest extra unnecessary sugars into our diet. Are you a keto guy in that? Would that be fair to say or what? (laughs) No, there's, um, or like a low carb guy at least. Yeah. Low carb, but I eat a lot of green leafy vegetables. Cancer hates that. So for me, I give. I give my body what cancer hates. And so, you know, broccoli, green leafy veg. So my salad, my daily salad would be larger than most families would eat. It's because, because this is a a huge part of what I consider to be a healthy diet in the morning. I'll have a smoothie and I'll put in that smoothie, I'll put kale or raw spinach. I did a lot of research went just shortly after getting cancer and looking at supplements and things that cancer didn't like, but the industry, I think it preys on people in that respect, just eat good whole foods if you can. And, you know, the jury is out on red meat. So red meat is one thing that I don't happen to eat myself. I've probably had a couple pieces of red meat, like wild bison. I had a wild bison burger maybe about seven or eight years ago, your listeners are going to think I'm totally crazy, but yeah, I've I've taken this really seriously. I don't eat red meat. I'll have chicken and I'll have wild fish. I won't have farmed fish just because of all the crap that they put into them, the antibiotics and all of the drugs and associated with trying to keep them healthy in a penned condition. So yeah, I do my best. I try to control what I can control. And then my last sort of health longevity related question having to do with energy maximization how do you what do you, is there anything that you actively do or try to do so that your energy stays level throughout the day so that you continue to have lots of energy i try to get a lot of sleep and i document my sleep and so like i'll actually write it down i'll have a goal and just if i don't do that what happens is i stay up a little bit later 
and later and later. Mm -hmm. And I tend to get up early, no matter what time I go to bed, it just, I just wake up and I can't go back to sleep. So the sleep is huge in terms of your body's recuperative powers. And so not only does it help you on a cellular level to allow your cells to generate and to keep, to maintain a sort of a healthy equilibrium, but it also helps us with our daily energy levels. And so, you know, I eat regularly. I, I'm not one of these people that just eats like two meals a day. I probably end up eating four smaller meals a day instead of two big meals a day. I drink a lot of fluids. I have a lot of green tea. It's an antioxidant. Mm -hmm. And of course, I never add any sugar or artificial sweeteners to them. Lots of water too. Lots of water. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks for that. Yeah. Didn't mean for this to turn into a health podcast, but I mean, you've, I know that's an area of focus for you. And then you've obviously researched that piece a lot as well. Uh, and I mean, yeah, the longevity thing is, is so critical, right? <laughs> you, you don't want to die with a multi-million dollar portfolio because you died early because you didn't take care of your health. So I really appreciate you sharing some insights and what, cause I know you've researched this quite a bit. So it's, it's great to sort of hear some, some best practices and what you've gathered. So, so thank you for that. I've got, I've got two more questions to go. It's kind of switching back to this sort of financial planning retirement topic, but maybe before I jump into those, can you tell us a little bit more about your book where we can get it? I know when we're going to be launching this episode, we're going to have it when the audio book version is available as well. So can you maybe tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, thanks. So Balance is available at all major retailers. And obviously it's available online and major brick and mortar meat retailers. There are links to it via my website at andrewhelm.com. But yeah, you could just go to any major retailer and, and you could find uh, copies of Balance. And then in March, the audio version will be coming out in March. Awesome. And then we covered this next question a little bit already, but in terms of maximizing happiness in retirement, is there a routine that you follow during any part of your day that works well for you? Or do you take a more fluid approach, a more go with the flow approach where things are more spontaneous? I think I mix it up. Like there are times when I'll write down exactly what I'm going to do in a given hour, and I'll actually have an alarm that will say, okay, I'm going to be writing from this time to this time, stretching from this time to this time. And I'll set little alarms and I'll check these things off. I'll have like recreation time in there too. So pool time. So I'm in Panama right now and it's hot. And so, you know, we like to go out and spend a little bit of time by the pool. I like to have nap time. <laughs> so yeah, I'm like a little kid and I'll have my nap in the afternoon. I really enjoy that. What I find is really interesting is that when I do structure days like this, and, and it doesn't always work out like something ends up happening and that's okay. You know, something ends up throwing the schedule off. But generally speaking, what I find is that when I do structure my days like this, I end up at the end of the day, I end up having had more leisure time, hmm. more exercise time, more nap time and more work time. Like I'm more productive on every single level versus when I'm just typically going with the flow. And it's not to say that I'm always really structured like that. Sometimes I just, I don't care and I will just go with the flow, but I, I do mix it up like that. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. That's inspired me to run that as an experiment as well. Try to, cause I already structure things a bit, but to try to like, like really structure and see how that, and see how that goes. But then it's not just all work, but it's also health and exercise and time with family and all that kind of stuff. Right. And see how that works. Exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. That's, That's exactly great. it. That's great. Do you find that goal setting and trying to achieve growth and improvement in retirement adds to your happiness and fulfillment? Or do you take the approach of just trying to be happy with where you are, you know, living in the moment as opposed to continuously striving for more? So kind of like, you know, that stoic sort of approach versus a more always trying to get more and build and grow approach. Yeah, it's funny because I think so much of that depends on like your natural personality. So for me, my natural personality is just like a glass half full kind of guy. And so I typically have a really happy disposition. And so I could be pretty much anywhere doing just about anything and I'll find something kind of fun and immature and goofy about that and actually enjoy that. So I do also enjoy like, you know, setting certain goals and trying to achieve them. So I'm definitely not a triple type A person though. So, you know, I have to rigidly you know, write something down that I might not want to do right now. I'm trying to learn Spanish and I'd love to be able to learn Spanish. I'd love to be able to speak it, but the actual process of going through and learning it, I find is really hard. Yeah. So I do have to structure that in. I can't go with the flow or I won't do it. Mm -hmm. I won't do it. So I've got my Duolingo 
I'll have yeah. my time and I'm online and I'm like, okay, I'm doing this. And then I can get outside and, and practice a little bit of what I've learned. But if I was going with the flow on that, Cornell, I wouldn't learn a lick of Spanish. <laughs> I heard too that with learning languages, how that's actually very beneficial for your your brain as well, right? Like in terms of just developing it and per- potentially preventing some future you know diseases like dementia, things like that. Because you're, I guess, what you were saying before, right? You're exercising the brain, you're yeah. building those uh, what are they called? Syna- syn- is it synapses or synapses? Yeah, right in the brain, and how that can be helpful. So very, very interesting. Yeah, and it stretches our perception of time. That's learning right. Language, that's right. Like you said, guitar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So your day feels longer. It feels more full yeah. when you're doing something like that. So yeah, I, I highly recommend that. Mm-hmm. I love that. And that's such a good strategy just to kind of extend that perception of time. That's that's fantastic. I'm totally going to try that. So that, that's great. That's all the questions that I had, Andrew. Thanks so much for coming on. This was a blast, just like the first interview. It's, it's great talking with you. Can you tell us again, just as a final reminder about your book, where we can get it, your website, all of that. Yeah, thanks. So andrewhelm.com is my website. So I publish my writings there. And yeah, the book, I'm so glad you're asking about that because I'm, I'm really, really proud of it. it. It's called Balance, How to Invest and Spend for Happiness, Health and Wealth. So I talk about how to invest for the best odds of success. And then I bring in these other aspects of success related pillars that I talk about. Because as I said, at the beginning of this interview, it's all about life satisfaction. It's all about that. Why do we pursue anything? Ultimately, it's about life satisfaction. So that was the essence that I was trying to work on when I wrote the book Balance. So thank you. Awesome. All right, Andrew. Well, thank you so much for coming on. And I hope to see you at the next summit as well. Thank you so much, Cornell. I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed chatting with you today. Me as well. Thanks so much. All right. See ya. Thank you. All right, a big thank you for Andrew to coming on again. And I also just want to give a big thanks to Shopify for sponsoring this month's episode. As much as we talk about investments and financial planning on the show, I always like to touch on having your own side business from time to time because it gives you that diversification when it comes to income sources. It can help you reach your financial independence number much quicker as well. And once you hit that number and are able to retire from your day job, having a side business can be a lot of fun and be fulfilling as well. And it's really nice to have that extra source of income, especially especially when the markets are turbulent. So I'm definitely a big fan of Shopify as they help make it easier than it's ever been to start, run, and grow your own business, whether it's a side business or a full-time business. They are already powering many of Canada's favorite businesses and now Canadians to sell their products worldwide. So you can go to shopify.ca slash BWC all lowercase for a free 14-day trial. There you can create your store with the look you want and there's no need for you to know how to design or code. So I really love how Shopify makes starting your own business possible for anyone, no matter what your experience level. You can try Shopify for free and they have 24-7 support. So they'll be with you every step of the way. So you can start selling on Shopify today by going to shopify.ca slash BWC right now. That's shopify.ca slash BWC, all lowercase. Thanks for tuning into the episode and see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Build Wealth Canada podcast at www.buildwealthcanada.ca. 